Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Kraus. Our guest today is Jameen Kapadia. Jameen is the systems engineering lead on Zipline's P2 product, um, the new five-bladed drone that we all saw in the Mark Rober video. Jameen, welcome to the pod. Hey, thanks, Spencer, for having me. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for coming on. I'm happy to have you here. Um, it was fun kind of striking up a friendship with you uh, pretty recently, and I'm grateful you accepted my invite to come on. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think we, we, we share common roots, so it's like happy to talk about that. We go back. I think it's unfortunate we didn't meet sooner. Completely agree. Yeah, kin- kindred spirits, really. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, yeah, I think you, you, you've been longer. I mean, I got into robotics like 17 years ago. It's funny. I was just like listening to your older podcast. I'm like, well, how long have I been doing it? But yeah, it's, uh, it's, been, it's been a fun time. That's awesome. Well, some of my years, though, like I, I was kind of I count the years I did before I got into it for a career. So like when I say I've been doing it like 23 years, like a lot of that was like as a hobbyist before I, I started doing it professionally. So, yeah, I mean, if you were doing it for your job, 17 years, you probably have more oh, no. professional than me. No, I was still I was starting four years of I guess six years of education. So I would bring it back to 11. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, what was it for? I mean, my my first robot was it's crazy. It was this crazy RC car. I wonder, like, what do you work on? Oh yeah, so my first one was a beam robot. I did. Uh, if you remember, like Mark Tilden's whole beam concept, uh, it was mid to late nineties. Uh, the idea was, I think it was biological, economical, aesthetic, and mechanical, which is kind of a dumb acronym, but um, yeah, you know, not to talk smack on Mark Tilden because you know he's one of my childhood heroes, but you know, it's just. You think about that, and like the biological is kind of the novel part. Mechanical, aesthetic, everyone wants the robot to look good. Economical, nobody wants a expensive more than it needs to be robot. Every robot has some mechanical elements. So I feel like really the novel bit is the biological part with that acronym. But the deal and, and the way the beam concept works is it's about like cannibalizing old like uh, floppy disks, um, disk drives mainly for like the motors, um, tape. Uh, like uh, VHS uh, players were like another common uh, donor, uh, hard disks. And you would get like motors out of that stuff. And then you would mm-hmm. take, um, you know, like simple like resistive capacitive circuits for like time delays, 555 timer ICs, uh, op amps, and, and you'd point to point solder uh, your robot's kind of brain, I guess, together. It wasn't even really a robot in like the sense of sense plan act, like so much as it was, you know, reactive. But I mean, the thing I did was, uh, and I sort of mimicked this on my world's most simple robot instructable I came out with like uh, a little over a decade ago. But, you know, you have two whiskers. Uh, The whiskers are connected to micro lever switches. And then um, you've got a uh, two double A batteries that are in series. And then you've got a tap in the center of the battery pack. um, And then you've got a positive terminal and a negative terminal. And your motor voltage runs off the um, tap between one battery and the other terminal. But then when you trigger a micro lever switch, um, it takes the motor on its side and it hooks it up to the opposite side of the battery pack through the same common terminal. So you can reverse that motor. So you have like a rudimentary obstacle avoidance by bumping into things robot. And so that was that was the first thing I ever built when I was like 12 years old. Um, and that was, that was my, my number one. What was the RC car you worked on? Uh, yeah, you know, it's funny, like five, five, five. I remember, I remember building circuits with that. I think that's how I got into it. I, I, I didn't start with the robots fast. I started building circuits. So I think my first thing was just a competitor. And then I think it was just, it was a timer basically, right? So it was a thing in a bi-stable state where you would like blink and LED using 555. But, oh, cool. And I did, I did that. And I think the other one I worked on like this, it was just a speaker circuit and you'd be able to modulate the sounds based on the frequency. 
the IC car was like just building your own kit. In undergrad, we would have these competitions where the idea was you you build your own RC car from scratch. Right? So you pick whatever motor combination you want. You design your own chassis. Uh, you'd get this RX circuit that you would hook in, and then it was it was manually controlled, right? So you still had the operator in, but then you would race them around these tracks, and that used to be a big deal. So kind of that's how I got into it, and I quickly realized that the the, the most times I messed up was because of the manual part. So I was like, all right, you know what? You just need to get the operator out of that equation. So it's kind of funny. Like, you don't have autonomous cars and you're kind of trying to do that. Which, I don't know, like, the are you following the whole autonomous racing? Like, they're building the um, cars. Yeah, we sponsored the Carnegie Mellon and Berkeley team a little bit. So, yeah, I've been, uh, you're talking about Indie Autonomous, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are like pretty cool. It's a cool sport, and those cars are pretty, pretty fancy. I mean, yeah, like they're not they're not the cheapest thing <laughs> to, to make. So it's kind of neat that they're giving, you know, students those kind of budgets and, and material access. Yeah, I mean, like you look at all of this, like the whole autonomous car thing was a DARPA competition, what, like in two thousands or something. You're talking about the uh, the DARPA Grand Challenge with like we're yeah. CMU at the Humvee. Yeah. I remember that because that's that's my home team. <laughs> so, yeah, that's right. They, the CMU team won, right? I think they did. I think two, so. Or... Yeah, that was uh, yeah. that would have been Red Whitaker's group, I think, at the time. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and they had that yeah, weird that... thing on the front of it that kind of looked like a like a angled spotlight. I still don't know what that sensor is. I I should know. I've like asked people that worked on it, and they've told me. And I, I still like I think it was like a laser thing, but I I can't remember for the life of me. <laughs> yeah. But it was like, you know, I think just like starting with building simple RC cars. And it was the same time that, you know, I think I was, this was also in India. So in the US, like at the same time, you're building autonomous cars. So I was like, all right, like, need, need to get out here. So that's kind of how I ended up moving to the US is to study at Penn. That's cool. So Penn's an awesome school. Um, it looked like just from like creeping on your LinkedIn, uh, you were involved in the grass lab there, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the grass lab is like, you know, it, it's a big lab. I think there's like, you know, I want to say, I don't even remember when I was there, it was at least like 20 to I think 30 faculty members and each was a separate lab. So Holy like shit. Grass Lab is an umbrella lab for a whole bunch of other robotics labs. So I was part of Mod Lab, um, which was doing modular robotics. Like you, you have this one degree of freedom modules that you could configure. And then, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's emergent behavior using those modules. And like, you could do gates with it. Uh, you could have robots that could, you know, you put wheels on. Like it, they had two or three different modules. So one was a single dock, the other was like a continuous rotation module. And then you would chain them, and then the bus could configure on itself and do a whole bunch of gates. And huh. you know, it was like the, the search and rescue was like kind of the the initial like scope. Which uh, that's interesting. Like, that almost seems like Howie Chosett's uh, heavy product yeah, a little bit in the yeah. Snake Lab because they they use a common actuator, I think, down the kinematic yeah. chain on that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, so I think I was working, you know, Mark Kim, uh, you know, this is the professor I was working with. So kind of that's what I went to Penn for and spent some time at Mod Lab. That's awesome. So you had a continuous rotation actuator and you had one that was presumably like 360 degrees or like. No, it wasn't 360. It was, we had 270. Okay. And okay. then. Um, and then, you know, the, the face, you know, there was a stationary face and a static, uh, and, and, you know, you know, the face that rotated, and then you would just a attach modules to it. And I believe we had CAN bus and IR. So there was like a, you know, like dual modality to communicate with it. So then you could just like link the chains together. Wait, and the we... problem is, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry to cut you off to it. So you're using IR for communication? Yeah, so I think the IR was like you use for communication, but then you would also know the end of the chain. Huh. That's really interesting. Yeah, near IR, right? It works quite well. Right? And then it would be mirrored as well. I don't know, so long ago, but I, I think we also had issues with like getting it robust, right? I don't know. Like, this comes up, right? Anytime but you have a configurable chain where you can just keep adding modules, like CAN in theory works great, but then you know, your your resistance goes out of hack as this thing wears, and then it's also like because it's moving, you know, and the the loads are shifting. Um, I think like that's why that's why we built redundancy in it. So the IR is there kind of as like a backup, 
comms platform a little bit, like when the CAN bus gets wonky. Yeah. That's interesting. But then does that, do you have issues with IR, like in like full sunlight, for instance, like getting washed out or? Yeah. I mean, so then once the modules connected, right. Um, and like for the most part, we had uh, modules that you would have to pre-configure, right? So you, you would screw the modules to each other. So then it's dark, right? You don't have to worry about sunlight getting in. Oh, that's interesting. And then it's like uh, on the inside of a tunnel. Yeah, exactly. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, that, that, that was fun. That takes me way back. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was a visiting researcher in the field robotics center at Carnegie Mellon for like a teeny bit after graduating. So that was that was kind of fun. Um, kind of just helped out on a bunch of different projects, <laughs> but uh, yeah. And they let me work on my battle bots in there, which was fun. So, oh man, yeah, yeah. I did that in grad school. The battle bots are fun. Yeah, yeah. I miss it. I uh, I obviously like don't have time for that anymore. And um, I don't know. I I was talking. I was interviewing somebody um, on the last episode who. Um, Russ Angold, he used to be the chief technical officer for Exobionics, and he was a he was got to be a host on Junkyard Wars. Mm. And I'm just oh, like, that was my favorite show. Same, up. right? <laughs> you know, I so love I was, it. You know, like, can I hug you? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Oh man, yeah, I used to love that show. I used to watch it religiously. Yeah, same. No, in, in like the early 2000s, like when I was a kid, that was that was one of my favorite things in the world, and. um yeah, Russ was like talking about like what it was like recording it. And apparently, you know, they had um, an uh, problem with an engine like exploding like the day before, and like all the teams just worked together, and like the production staff called up every junkyard they could find, you know, like nearby that might have the engine, and you know, just to be able to put on a good show, and they they like got it fixed in like a few hours, and then yeah, yeah. they still were able to do the competition. So. How, how much of how much of that was scripted? I don't know. Just it, it's kind of you know working on hardware. You realize how like every time there's a demo, and I think I've done this in school. I've done this at companies. Like whatever whatever can go wrong does go wrong. I yeah. wonder how much of that show was scripted. Probably most, like maybe not most, but like I would imagine a quick a great deal. I'm I'm getting out of my depth here because I wasn't there when he recorded it, and I, I should have asked him. But, I mean, he did say they had, like, an extra day before, like, the demonstration to, like, make sure their thing worked uh, yeah. that they didn't film. So, like, that kind of makes sense. Yeah. Because, yeah, you know, I mean, sense. nothing ever. Like, in two days to get, like, something with, like, the complex. Usually it seemed like they did a lot of hydraulics. So, to yeah, get something exactly. like hydraulic working in two days and, like, not have leaks or engine failure or anything like yeah. that i mean like you know and then some of the things they found in that junkyard i think they would they would plant you know like just crazy good stuff for them to find you know like a garbage truck with like all the hydraulics intact or something like yeah you know, right by their encampment you know? yeah it's also crazy right like like now like doing this as a career i'm like oh my god you you put a structure together without doing the full structural analysis and the modal analysis like i'm like <laughs> i have no i have no confidence in this thing taking the notes <laughs> but you would also see the failures on junkyard wars like the stuff would crack and yeah. you know they would yeah it, it would it would break spectacularly and so i mean that kind of i feel like that came through <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> and they only ran it for an hour and so it's like yeah you can't even hit an hour of service life man like yeah but you built it in two days out of trash so i guess that's okay that, exactly you know that, that's more of like the quick demo like it's a quick concept that you put together when you're like huh, i wonder how this goes together or like you 3d print something and oh man like 3d yeah. printing has been so great like you can just build whatever you want and at least like see it in form it's been it's been such an enabler yeah, I haven't I haven't really like gotten deep into it. Like I, I still haven't bought a home three D printer, for instance. Like I, I've used them at work. Yeah. But I I, I feel like I, I oh. the bamboo oh, I one seems you. desirable. Like I, I feel like that's kind of the first one I'd want to buy that I've seen on the market. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, both three D printers also spoil you. Like my, my first three D printer was like I think we had an FDM at the first company, but then when I was at Medtronic, like we had we had an SLA, we had sintering in house, we had FDM where they would clean the parts and we could do multi-jet. Oh, that's uh, cool. You know? And then like they they I mean, you know, 
I mean, it's it's great working for a large company that has the resources because you you had some you would just send them the parts like you you ship an STL and then next day morning by the time you get to work you get this nice clean part that's just ready for you to do the testing, and like after going through that I'm like I don't want a home printer that has FDM that I need to go break off the support and spend all the time cleaning. Well, I mean that's true, but like the in theory what I like about the bamboo printer even though it's an FDM is that. It's supposed to be able to do like filament changes automatically. And mm -hmm. um, it's meant to like, it supports like running over a network. So you don't have to, um, you know, do the thing where you dick around with the Raspberry Pi with Octoprint and, and have that be a server oh, see, and spend yeah. all this time hacking it and spinning it up. Yeah. And then like, it's, it's meant to be like the first one that really feels like a consumer product where, mm -hmm. you know, it's like they, they've done all the hard work for you and you're, and you're not, fighting it and like trying to stand it up and like troubleshoot it all the time. So yeah. from that perspective, it seems like in theory, pretty, pretty awesome to own, but it's still FDM. I mean, which yeah. means, you know, it's going to have that layer, you know, adhesion yeah. nonsense that you get with an FDM and it's not going to have that nice SLS, you know, look to the parts yeah. you make. And, but I don't know. I mean, it seems kind of solid and I think I want to say they're, seem to be priced around if I if I'm remembering right like 1500 bucks like or yeah. somewhere around there so it's like not ridiculous so I don't know yeah that, that's yeah it's a good comp I, I also like the farm labs one I've been eyeing that for a while but it's it's more expensive I think it's 2500 what are, what do they got now like what what's form labs doing these days because I haven't like looked at them in maybe like a decade or so so I don't know what their new line is yeah I think I don't know. I haven't kept up either, but I know that, that entry level thing. Like, it, you know, it's like it seems like they get the cleanest parts, and it's still yeah. Well, because they are they still yeah. SLA or if they? I, I think with the fuse they were doing like metal, right? Uh, I never. I don't think they ever. I mean, I don't know. I'm looking at their website now, but yeah. I don't know if they ever went to metal. Uh, maybe they had the powder stuff, but. I think just you know you know serial lithography just gives you cleaner parts right and then you know you don't have to deal with the support as much or you can just dissolve it so you don't have the same it's still multi material yeah 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 for sure and i'm i'm told it's like good with like elastomer type materials too where yeah yeah you know you you can i mean basically uh you get these rubbery parts that are like pretty, pretty awesome, like right out of the thing. Yeah. So it's good for and like printing. Them. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. It's cool. Like I haven't thought about this at all. And yeah. I think I, I moved, I moved away from doing design a couple of years ago. So now it's like being in systems, it's different. I don't, I don't get to play around as much with parts or Same. design. <laughs> so, I don't know, it's better to see. There are days that I really miss the design days when you could just be like, you know, go build something and then you own that versus systems where like now it's a lot of like team coordination and hardware, software, but it has, it has its own joys, I guess. PowerPoints and pictures. Are you guys doing like model-based stuff or can I, do I get to ask about that? <laughs> uh, I mean, we, 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 I mean, it's a little bit. I mean, we, we do a lot of modeling, right? When you're building an aircraft, um, you know, I, I think, and Zipline's big on the whole, like, you know, build fast, just the heck out of it. Um, and, you know, and make sure you deliver a really re reliable and robust product. But like modeling is a huge part of that. Like you want to make sure, like you still build physical prototypes and you learn a lot from it, but we do, like, I think more modeling than I've ever seen done in my career before. That's um, awesome. And it's also, it's also flying vehicle, right? So you don't have the luxury of having that extra, you know, an extra gram or extra 10 gram is a big deal for an aircraft. Like, yeah, yeah. That's, the, that's the difference between something that like, you know, is able to deliver a product and can fly versus something that doesn't take off or, you know, has a really crappy range. So uh, yeah, we do an impressive amount of modeling upfront, um, even before anything's built together. I'm like, I'm kind of impressed at how good, like how good our results are and how close, you know, especially with Aero, uh, you know, there's always like, you always need to, like you need to build an aircraft. You need to go to a wind tunnel and actually make sure that your parameters are what you thought they are. But they have, they have some pretty good model correlation. That's awesome. Yeah, and yeah. It, it sort of helps. Like that, the cycle for like iteration is just so much faster. Like mean, you can test so many things if you have a good model. Yeah, that's that's really really cool. 
So you mentioned like a faster iteration cycle. Like, what does that look like? You know, like between, you know, I don't know, like, I guess an easy way to quant qualify it for like, you know, somebody that's used to the design side would be like from like one prototype to the next. Yeah. And it, I mean, I realize that varies in fidelity and could mean a lot of different things. So, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think I can, you know, uh, you know, give you some context. Right? You know, the 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 platform. You know, the P one platform. I think that's probably a good example, right? So, I think the first time we flew it, I mean, the the, the company the company's been around since twenty thirteen. I think twenty sixteen is when we sort of started doing our first operations in Rwanda, um, and you know, we've gone through, you know, several iterations. Like, I think we have four or five. I don't actually. I don't know for sure because I don't work on P one. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> Uh, but we, we've gone through several iterations there in six years for an aircraft. And you, you compare that with, you know, traditional aerospace where it takes 10 years <laughs> and a billion dollars to get one aircraft out to market. And like, sure, it's, uh, you know, it, it's crazy. Like, you know, uh, you know like our, our aircraft looks like a hobby drone, but unlike a hobby drone, this is a workhorse that's like, you know that is delivering life critical like you know deliveries like yeah you know, we, we we can't mess up right like you know blood like medicine we, i mean stuff people it, need exactly right so you know i think that is a test testament to the level of model right like in six years to have a crew i think we are at six hundred and ninety thousand deliveries so far oh wow I think some, yeah uh, so an impressive amount and you know you know, with a few iterations of hardware and then day in and day out, you know, we're doing deliveries. I think, you know, we do thousands of deliveries a day. And it's cool. We have this counter at the company where it's like, yeah, every day it goes up. And like, you might be in a meeting half an hour later, you know, it's like now the counter went up by a couple of hundred, right? Because it's like consolidating <laughs> you know, all of our operations. So it's, that's yeah. wild. Yeah, that's... I think that's like maybe a good sense of like, you know, what what that modeling gets you and then you know, combined with all other testing. So really it's just like pushing like the longer tail of reliability, like just, just making sure, you know, your drones are, you know, smooth running, you know, operable safe when they fail. Cause you know, if you're running those quantities, you're going to have failures. Yeah. And yeah. Like w one in a million is a real thing. Like one in a million can, is going to happen very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I saw in the Mark Rober video, there were like parachutes and these things and, and stuff like that, which is, is just super cool. I mean, that, you know, you guys are thinking at that level of, of redundancy and safety, especially when you're working with, you know, down to the gram, you know, we've only got so much weight and we're going to use like, I don't know what a parachute weighs, but I imagine it's something on the order of like at least 50 grams, probably more than that. And yeah. so, um, yeah, no, that's wild, you know, and you're like, well, it's worth it because, you know, one in a million, you know, don't want to hit something. So, yeah, yeah, and I, I think, yeah, but, you know, I think it's, you know, this is, uh, I think it's, it's, you know, engineers are conservative and like, I think like some of the best engineers always have that voice in their head that says, what if, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, like, it, I think we have the parachute system. Um, and it's good we have it. I think it allows us to sleep well at night knowing we have it. But at the same time, you know, in order to like, if if we had if we had a parachute deployment once a you know once a cup you know a couple of months, that would be really bad because that meant that that delivery failed, and that was like one life saving supply that didn't go. So it, it's like the parachute is really for that you know. And with autonomy, right, you always have those unknown unknowns, like so extreme weather. And, you know, I think that's another thing. Maybe, you know, operating in like some of the tropical countries, like you know, if you're talking about a rainfall rate of like, you know, 75, 80 millimeter an hour, like that's more rain than we get in a shower head here. So like imagine <laughs> you have this and, and also the winds that come up with it, right? Like, you know, it, you know, you might take off a flight and it's like nice and sunny. You fly 100 kilometers and it's thundering there and the like, winds are blowing at, you know, 20, 30 miles an hour. Um, and I say at that point, like the zip is completely getting blown out of course. So I think that's the long tail for why we have those systems. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's mostly for loss of power or extreme weather. Uh, but yeah, I think, 
you know, even though we've done like what 40 million miles, I think we've like uh, we've had a few parachute deployments, but no critical injuries. So we're a pretty good safety record and not not relying on them too much. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So it's a last Wait. resort. It's like you know, very, very, very uncommon. Yeah. That yeah. And I think you know, every every time we have one of those, there's like a, there's a tiger team and like you, know, you spend I think there's a there's a retro on like why that happened. And like usually again, like a fix, you know, is rolled up in days, if not weeks, you know, to make sure that doesn't happen. So Oh that's awesome. You know, yeah, so you just like increasing that reliability, and it's kind of great right? because like that's kind of what our growth has been like. like. We've done, I think, of like all the deliveries we've done, I think we've done half of them in last year alone. Wow! So uh, it, it's kind of crazy. I think like I've seen that number. I've seen the the delivery number double. Uh, like, you know, like at least like I've been here for like one and a half years now. So like at my time, and we haven't had that many incidents or like. You know when that incident happened, so I haven't heard enough, which is great. Yeah, that's that's badass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's pretty. It's a it's a fun place to be. I, I love the idea of like the post op on on a parachute deployment too. Like I'm just picturing like Richard Feynman with the space shuttle, being like, oh, yeah, it's the O rings, <laughs> you know, like figuring it out. Yeah. Over like a lot of you know asking questions and and digging in and then you know preventing that same type of failure from ever happening again. I mean that is. Yeah, that is methodical. <laughs> yeah, so. you know that's it's crazy, right? Like it's not sexy, but that's what you know. Think about it. Like you know, I've taken ten flights this year, and I don't think twice. You know, you're getting on this thing, you know. Like it's it's a testament to the whole aerospace industry, right? Like you know, it's safer than driving a car, and you, you are like ten thousand feet in the air. Like the only thing that's between you and the environment is this thin aluminum thing and you're flying. And then, you know, it's like, I go to India, you take 18 hour flights and the thing just works. And I think that's just been like the regulatory team. And like, yeah, you know, it's like, it's just like forcing you, like every time you have an incident, learn from it and then make sure it doesn't happen again. Yeah. Well, and those guys are doing crazy, like from my friends at um, Pratt and Whitney, I mean, those and like other, you know, aerospace company i mean those guys are doing insane you know analysis and systems engineering and you know it's just super duper disciplined and and preventative maintenance and like you know like testing the crap out of every engine and component and wing and you know retesting like you said learning from every single incident and then you know building that into the future designs and i mean it's yeah that's that's really awesome that you get to live in that world yeah. Yeah. I think that's kind of what, what brought me to the flight. I mean, I, I didn't know, I think when I came on, I think P2 was still pretty hush hush. So, uh, like nothing was disclosed personally. And I was just looking at P1 and like the impressive track record there. And I was like, well, uh, and it's also like the time, right? I mean, I was at Medtronic for eight years. Uh, and that was a pretty cool, like we, we bought a first generation surgical robot to market. I do want to um, dig into that too, by the way. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious to, to kind of get into that one as well. Uh, oh yeah, for sure. Uh, but yeah, it's, I think just like, you know, it's like what sort of, you know, motivated me to to look into the fly and sort of, you know, work here was sort of that track record of like, you know, you, you built something that didn't exist before against all odds. Then like, you know, all of us are like, yeah, like, like, like everyone wants a drone delivery, but like building that service, that scale is incredibly hard. And, you know, for the team to have done that work and to have that kind of number so it's like really impressive and still impressive. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> That's really cool. So I guess just to, to pivot over to Medtronic, um, what are, uh, did you, how far did you take that product? I mean, eight years is a long time. Did you, um, did you go through FDA? Uh, were you more on the early stage? Was a little bit of both? Um, what, what was your involvement like there? Yeah, so uh, it wasn't even Medtronic when I started. It was Covidian because Medtronic acquired Covidian like around like by year three, I want to say. So this was in twenty thirteen, um, and uh, so so Covidian, you know, it's uh, the origin of Covidian was making surgical staplers. Uh, oh, cool! And you know, yeah, I think they yeah, have one of those in my first aid kit. It's, uh, I mean, they're all. I haven't had to use it yet on a person, but they're they're great. Yeah. I mean. They, but they invented it, right? And if you think about, like, you know, surgical safety, like, man, like, 
I have a lot of respect for surgeons. So like, just like, <laughs> I, I have, and I've only like, I'm, I'm maybe been in one or two actual surgeries. I've been a lot of cadaver labs, but you know, yeah. um, it's a lot of work, right? And you know, especially with the advent of so you know, anyway. So Covidian started with surgical staplers, and yeah. initially it was surgical sta- surgical staplers for open surgeries, right? So uh, for open surgery, I think it's 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 more of a convenience, right? And you As you know, opposed you use to a this... non-invasive surgery, that's like when you've got like you know the sternum spread open and or something exactly. like that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So if you talk about the taxonomy of surgery, I guess they just so there's open, there's minimally invasive, and then there is robotic minimally invasive, right? And, and all it. of these okay. are just general surgeries, yeah. right? So uh, open surgeries, you know, you 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 put a big incision in someone, uh, and you know the surgeon spread can the use edges their open. Hand. You can see what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. Um, Directly and, without a scope. Um, exactly, yeah. and it's like that. You know, which is how surgeries have been done for the longest of time. Yeah. yeah. Um, right. Uh, but you know, I think you know the the advent of like electronics and like you know having small cameras that kind of opened the doors for uh, minimally invasive surgery, where you know you're going through this you know a, a tiny scope, but then if you're going through just a small hole, if you imagine like if you're dice, you know, if you are separating major vessels. You want the ability to cut and seal them at the same time. Like if you think about it, like if you have to, oh, that's interesting. To, so without staplers, you can't do like you know, you, you know, if it's a bariatric surgery, you are like you know, you're you're going to make someone's stomach smaller. Yeah. You you want to cut and close both sides of it simultaneously because otherwise you just like you know you're going to have this open thing. But how do you close a wound? Like also if yeah, you're doing a I, mean, I would think cautery comes to mind as like an alternative there, but maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong. So cautery works on smaller issue like oh, on smaller yeah. vessels, right? Yeah. Like you know, you're talking about, you know, I think I, I'm probably remembering that, but I think that we could do like you could take um I think the the the, the largest covidian stapler could take like really thick tissue. You can like, cauterize talking... an entire limb amputation, though. I thought like, uh, but maybe that doesn't work when you're like inside a person and and yeah. doing crazy intricate stuff. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Think about like putting two vessels together, and also you know they they do these procedures where they might take part of your intestine out, right? So then you you chop a section out. You need to take these two sections and attach them together. And then, so, you know, like, we didn't make these, like, circular staplers as well. Oh, that's I was, like, cool. It's, just, it's the coolest thing. Like, you take these two that's tubes. Really cool. You take these two tubes, and then you can fuse them together, and then it'll staple it along are the you, circumference. Are you using stainless for the staples, or is there some biodegradable material uh, that, that gets absorbed into the body that's being used? Um, I think folks would get upset if I got into the material. Ah, no worries. So let's, just, let's just say it's biocompatible. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, uh, my dad's an ortho surgeon, and and he was telling me that like back in the day, um, you know, when you would wire up um, somebody's like sternum, like after like an open chest surgery, um, like if you you know like if somebody's anatomy was all screwed up, and he, as quote he said, you did what you had to do to get them back together, and mm-hmm. the wiring looked a little sloppy, like you might get a malpractice suit off the tail end of the X ray. Because you know it would it would like look kind of crappy. So like when some of the um, newer materials started coming out, where you could you know go biocompatible or not not biocompatible, but like bioabsorbable. So you know it just like dissolvable sutures basically like that. That was a game changer in, in one way because it sort of gave the surgeon more leeway in what they could do, and you know the patient would would heal either way. But you know like. I don't know. It's just a weird thing you don't really think about, but that's that's one of the one of the reasons. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you know, it's like getting back to like sorry. So, <laughs> uh, so so you know they they they're like you know they were they were big into you know laparoscopic like minimally invasive instruments, um, you know, and and you know intuitive surgical is like you know they kind of started the whole field of like robotic surgery, right? And but that was uh, that was still like. Like I think '90s is kind of where they they found the niche, and for a while I think they struggled. They initially started with like the idea was to do cardiac surgery, and I I think it came out of MIT the research I forget huh. it, it, it came out of academia. I think yeah, there's actually a, a you know the first generation robot. If you're ever in Boston, 
you go to the MIT museum, uh, they, they, at least they used to have, I don't know if they do anymore, but like the first version of the minimally invasive surgical robot, which is, you know, someone figured out a clever way to maintain the constraint that, you know, statically. So, you know, I mean, in, if you're, if you're putting an incision, you know, in here, yeah. you, you don't want to move laterally, right? So no, the degrees would... of freedom, yeah. So you want two degrees of freedom. So you want one, two, and then you want in and out. And yeah, that yeah. gets you anywhere you need to go. And the, the I think there was there was some patterns about how to do that just like mechanically. So that oh, you that's never really interesting. That so like even yeah. if you have like a total software failure, you're still exactly. going to be constrained in that regard. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So and I think that like most surgical you know, platforms, like even like the Medtronic or the Intuitive, like respect that in hardware. Right. So it's like it kind of helps when you do your safety analysis. Where you're like, oh yeah, this motor completely failed. Okay, you still did not like you know you didn't apply a high force and like you know cause the the actual incision to go bigger right so remote center of motion that's awesome so you know over over the years you know as imaging has improved um you know the the one thing that robotic surgery you know really helps with is uh you know is you know for 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 prostatectomies and you know the the reason for that is like the prostate is you know uh, it, it's a it's a hard place to access um, and you know, it's it's a common enough surgery where I think eighty percent of all prostate surgeries in the U.S. are done robotically. Oh, that's amazing! And, I did not know that. Yeah, and you know, so the so intuitive kind of started with uh, you know looking at cardiac procedures, and then they pivoted to uh, you know pivoted to prostatectomies, and then that's like that's just growing. And then you know that was kind of the uh, you know the you know the way they got into the field and like today like you know most general surgeries can be done using the robot um, right and you know as as like there's as there's a market for that the technology has gotten better and better right so you know better materials you know allow you to have better instruments and you also have two degrees of freedom right so if you're doing this laparoscopically mostly you know you only have you might have one degree of rotation and jaw yeah. but that's not enough degrees of freedom. Like what you really need is two degrees of freedom and a jaw, yeah, because yeah. then that's like having a wrist. So, you know, like the, the access combined with the dexterity that the robot provides became like a really compelling reason to use the robot for surgery. Yeah. Uh, so when I joined Covidian, I think they had the, you know, they were starting their new surgical robotics division. Uh, and it was really cool because the the, the marketing team was like, Build us a surgical robot. You need to do. You need to do this as fast as possible. Um, with just name whatever resources you. I mean, want. eight years is pretty fast to get a surgical robot to market. You know, like that's, that's yeah. wild. From from like from a blank sheet of paper. Yeah. Uh, right. And I think I should say a blank sheet of paper because there was still a team. Uh, but you know, when I joined the the team, they were really small, so they had a few concepts of what what it could look like, but. Uh, I got a chance to work on all aspects of the surgical robot. Right? So I started on the instrumentation team, cool. designing the part that you know, just the, the just the just the wrist and the mechanisms for the wrist, and I got some cool patterns out of it. Nice. And then I kind of I kind of worked backwards from the chain. Uh, you know, like keeping sterility uh, is non-trivial for that actuator. If you think about it, so I think autoclave is like. You know, zipline drones experience some pretty nasty environments, yeah. but I and you know you you would think that the surgical room is not right. Like everything is well controlled, it's twenty five k, but then you throw autoclave in there, and it's the nastiest stuff you can do. Period to anything. Like it's extremely it's extremely corrosive alkaline solvents and soaps that you use to clean. This. Oh, you're talking about like your your instrumentation having to be able to survive an autoclave. <laughs> yeah, and then you know you put this thing in like 180 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, 180 C steam for 10 minutes. Most yeah. materials don't survive, but you. And so you know it's really, and you know they make autoclavable motors, but they're super expensive. And best of luck getting any smart electronics in there, right? Like you just don't get the power density you need. So yeah, yeah makes sense. Um, so from from instruments, I spent some time doing the sterile interface module. So it almost uh, then sounds I, like you've got to have like some kind of linkage mechanically to motors that are in a place exactly where, yeah. It, it, yeah you need you need to, you need to find a way to decouple it but it's also tricky because you have to deal with failovers right so that was kind of my introduction of like well what happens if the robot 
stops working for whatever reason. You make it as reliable as you can, but you know it's kind of analogous to like how we have parachute. Like for a surgical yeah. robot, if anything goes wrong, the saving grace is that the surgeon is in the room. There. <laughs> yeah. and, and you know it's funny because like you know there, there've been so many conversations where like I've had like with surgeon friends and they're like, so you know uh, can I use this for telepresence or can I use you know is this going to replace me? And I'm like, I don't know, right? Because like if something goes wrong. you you know you need humans you need a human surgeon close enough that they can take the robot they can move it away and you know complete the surgery so you know this terrain interface was a critical part of that and you know i have to think about all of like the corner cases of like what happens if you're clamped on a vessel and you know you're in this weird rotation where you're ah. you're pulling on to something and then the robot fails so now like how how do i get this out of the tube because it's going to stick Uh, or do, so, you, do you just have to work around it in that case? I wonder, just to maintain. Well, I guess you'd have to unclamp eventually. Yeah. So uh, you know, it's crazy. Like it, it was this. It started off as a simple sterile interface, and then there was so much complexity in this little plastic adapter that had to survive autoclave, that had to have all of these release mechanisms. Uh, so I spent like a lot of time doing injection molding for all of those parts, like you know tolerance stacks, like because again, like ah, similar... I want to ask about materials, but I can't. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no worries. Okay, so autoclaves, tolerances, injection molding. Yeah, um, um, and then I I kind of like moved away from that. I, I worked on the actuator design because like it turns out you also need to pick the right actuators that you can back drive and release. So then I I, I did. gearbox design mechanical layout all that and I eventually ended up working on the robotic arm itself as well as the, the you know the, the control station that they used to drive it so uh, you know i saw uh, what kind of know. controls were you guys using for that like um i've not i'll be honest i haven't had a good close up look at the medtronic robot um So I mean I think all of these are telepresence robots right so uh, I mean teleoperated robots on telepresence yeah, yeah. if you will so But are you using uh, like a miniature version of the robot that the surgeon can manipulate or is it kind of similar to the Da Vinci control No so where it's like oh sorry after you uh, No I mean like, you know you 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 want oh man it's crazy like you don't think about it but the the input device is actually more complicated than the part that does the surgery <laughs> <laughs> Uh, because you know the the part that does the surgery, you know, you 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 can rationalize the degrees of freedom, uh, but you know the 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 part that the human is inputting it, you want the full six degrees of freedom, and you want this for both arms, and then you also want some way of getting you know the the jaw position. So it actually becomes like a seven degree of freedom. Uh, so you okay you want... with the seventh being the jaws, yeah, like amount of openness. Okay, exactly, and then you know it, it's. It's not, you know, I, I don't know. Like, if you ever, if you ever worked on anything teleoperated, like it has to, like human latency, especially when you're closing the loop with like visual and forces. You know, you can, if you're not careful with that, you can quickly go to instability, right? Because yeah, there is a, in there. Yeah, exactly. Right? It's like it's classic haptics, right? And everything has to be just right. And you know, it's you don't realize it, but like these surgeons kind of are like like pro gamers. Like their reflexes are amazing. <laughs> It's like I I I I would I think uh, and I spent a lot of time like you know doing that's that's kind of how I got into systems is you know we realized after like building all of these systems that when we integrated everything together like there was just some something lacking about the system performance um, and that's kind of like how I migrated from like you know like being an IC doing design to now being a systems person who's thinking. not just in terms of what is the mechanism and the electromechanical chain but also like how is controls playing into this you know how is communications latency going in through this and like we had a pretty we had a distributed system so you know you know, you move an actuator you know that input device has you know has its own compute then you know you need to do all of this mapping because you know the surgeon is manipulating in cartesian space in their cartesian space and you need to transform that with respect to what the camera is seeing. Yeah. So if my if my camera is coming in this way versus coming in this way. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, with this and I think that's another thing that's what makes the robotic surgery easier on the surgeon is if you don't have the robot you're doing this transform in your head. 
And you know, if you want to know how difficult this is, just start rotating your mouse 90 degrees and like your brain hurts. Yeah. It's like uh, trying to fly like an RC helicopter, like before they had any of the DGI like drone stuff and like you're looking at it head on and it's facing you. Yeah. It's, it's super, I mean, I'm sure it's harder than that, but like that for me is difficult. Yeah. Like I crashed a lot of right. RC helicopters in grad right. school. And, and, and you're doing this in someone's body. <laughs> where the frame of reference is like completely messed up. Plus, you have the rotation degree of freedom there, so you don't know your top from bottom. Also, like, man, like, you, like, I, I, I've, I've, like, in spite of the number of surgeries I've seen, like, I can't make out where I am in the body. Like, it's all red, it's all tissue. But these surge, like, you know, when you're doing a surgery, the surgeon's thinking about, like, uh, you know, they, I mean, they follow this anatomic, you know, they, they have features, but, you know. Like you can't cut the wrong vein. You can't go close to the wrong artery. Like you need to make sure where all of the nerves are. And then sometimes they are looking at a CT scan image completely separately on a different window. Oh, wow. like, this is this is the nodule, and I need to get to this nodule based on what I'm seeing right now. So the robot does some of that lifting, and I think that's kind of the future of tele of robotic surgery, if you will is being being able to take all of these different like you know your MRI scans your CT scans and being able to overlay all of that yep. and so that you are like because the other tricky thing is that it's all soft tissue so if you take your MRI on your stomach and then when you do the procedure you might be on a 45 degree incline and everything's going to move yeah yeah <laughs> So that's yeah, that always man. seemed like an interesting problem with a bunch of surgical systems is when you do the imaging and then like, you know, you're doing the surgery with static imaging from before that's not actually evolving. Like you said, I mean, like, especially with something like that, where it can just jiggle. You know, like yeah, gravity, it's, it's all, yeah, you know, it's, it's all gravity, right? It's all, and yeah. you know, the, the other thing you don't realize is also, you know, scar tissue, right? So, uh, you know, every, every person is unique. And then as that person ages through time, if they've had previous surgery, you know, like the body heals around it. So then there is a lot of like, there's a lot of scar tissue. So it's like, you know, the surgeons spend a long time just getting to the target area, you know, because like they're just, you know, in case of prior surgery, which like if you're, if you're doing a hernia surgery, there's always scar tissue around. So you need to be mindful of that. Uh, but anyways, um, I think I, 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 I digress. No, this it, is a good tangent. I'm, I'm enjoying this. <laughs> it's, I love it. Like, I, I think I had uh, so much let's fun. Let's just talk about this for hours. <laughs> so. Uh, that's that's really really cool um and, and I, was great. I i always i always felt really good um working on on that sector too like the the surgical um and the life sciences stuff like i i feel like uh you feel like not a douche working on it and the problems are so interesting and complex that like you know it, it kind of keeps you intellectually stimulated you know for forever like yeah. it's, it does not get boring. <laughs> so yeah, I yeah I I think I've been fortunate enough to to always have like mission aligned, like very mission driven companies. Yeah, uh, and I know it's 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 safety critical. Like I think that's something that I really enjoy as well, right? Like you know, it was the same with the surgical robot. Like, like your control, if you mess up the transform, <laughs> or if you forget to take some, you know, uh, you know, you don't take a. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, or you get a transform wrong, or you get a degree of freedom wrong. You're like now moving left instead of right, and like you know, or if you don't have your accuracy right, like if there is any unintended motion, you could rupture an artery and yeah. cause someone to bleed. So you have to be like really careful about that. Your mouse is sideways, <laughs> as you put it. It's so. it's really hard, and uh, I, I think our. I mean, I, I didn't work on the controls, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's a complexity. I mean, of their own. I, disrespect for those. Guys. I don't I don't do a whole lot of kinematics at this point in my career. Like I've I've you know sort of helped to manage teams that have been working on difficult robot kinematics problems. But I remember when I was in graduate school and I was like doing those transforms manually. It was so easy to just put a minus sign in the wrong place. And, yeah. and now the whole thing's, you know, different than where you thought it was. And, you know, like everything that yeah. is downstream in the kinematic chain is wrong. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you, if, yeah if, if you're ever doing like, you know, I think it was the DH parameters. It's like, uh, I think that's how you do it, right? Like you do the forward and then you do the inverse. And then, you know, the inverse is also tricky because 
if you have redundant degrees of freedom, you get multiple solutions. So now yep. which one do you pick? And, uh, again, that's, I mean, that's a challenge across all of robotic, uh, you know. Yeah. Well, that would be inverse kinematics, right? Where you you have yeah. like an infinite number of like you know I don't know I want to be here, but my my yeah. elbow can do this, and so yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, and and you don't think about it like humans do this thing, like, like no, like you you do this in your sleep, like you could be like you could control something, and you know you see some of these crazy birds too, like you know hummingbirds, right? Like it, you know, like their, their neck and the beak is stationary while the whole body is wiggling and all, like it's insane. Yeah, no, that that you thing has. That's pretty good onboard compute for sure. <laughs> I know. Yeah. The I think the at, at the same time it's match. Right? So I think once you write it out, then there are solvers to do that. So uh, you know it's all deterministic, which is interesting. You know compared to you know the autonomy that you know I I deal with these days is like at the appliance. It's it's like everything is statistical. Like you know air risk is statistical and like safety targets are statistical. So at least the problem of inverse, uh, you know, yeah. Like in most kinematics, is this, you, know, you can solve it and you get a solution. Then once you figure it out, provided you're meticulous with it, it's going to always be right. And you can trust the computer to do the same compute every time, <laughs> as opposed to like me hand calculating something and then best of luck getting the same answer. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, well, I mean, when we would do those um, kinematic like proofs and, and all that, it would be like pages of math, you know, <laughs> it's like uh -huh. <laughs> to hand calc any of that. I mean, it was. Yeah, and, and, and we, we use a lot of modeling there too. Uh, uh, yeah. It's it different. I think uh, all of our structures, you, know, we, we, you could just throw it at it. You're like, yeah, you know, just add a little bit more aluminum to make it as stiff as you can or you know, whatever. The, the material yeah. that, shall, that shall remain unnamed. <laughs> the material that shall remain unnamed, yep. Yeah, add add whatever you gotta add, um, like thickness, yeah. you know, like or yeah, you can you can yes. beef things up. When I worked in mining, it was like that. Like, you could have factors of safety of like five on a thing mm -hmm. because you would just add. Like I think in in the Joy Global mining vehicles I worked on, like we would use, um, like you just would shovel lead into the counterweight that went opposite like the the diggy bit. Tell <laughs> mm. <laughs> so I'm really academic about this. The diggy bit. <laughs> and so, um, like, I mean, and the design methodology was along the lines of like, well, just make it beefier, you know, use steel, not al aluminum's for, you know, for wimps, you know, yeah. use, use the steel. Yeah. It really, I, I think the argument that the senior mechanical engineers would give as to why you should use steel over aluminum was to do with cyclic loading, but yeah, it was yeah, kinda, you get yeah. I mean, you don't have the endurance limit, right? Like with, with aluminum eventually you have to replace it with steel if your stresses are below a value you don't have to worry about it yeah i think that was the idea and because we're in like a high vibe environment with yeah. a tracked vehicle you know that was that was kind of where yeah. that, that logic came from yeah yeah which again like i think you know like aerospace is but you don't, you don't have you don't, that, you don't have you that don't factor have of safety liberty. you're not you're not even at 1.5 as far as i know on an aircraft like I think, I think like, I mean, again, not like a huge aerospace nerd. I'm curious, but I, I feel like you're not even at 1.2, like a lot of times, I'm like an aircraft. Yeah. And so yeah. like, I don't know, you probably have to just be way smarter with how you, you know, you, you go about getting that. Yeah. I, and I think you, I think it's also like how good of a load you get. Right. I think that that's how you might have a small enough, uh, you might have a small factor of safety, but your loads are very well quantified. And that's again, where simulation comes in, right? Like you, you know, you do your error simulation to get your error loads and then you do your fatigue on, you know, you do your fatigue, um, you know, testing. And again, you simulate that as well. So, you know, eventually, even though you have a small factor of safety, the end result is like so much more safe and reliable because you, you go that extra leg to understand the loads. Uh, the, the trickiest bit, at doing this at uh, you know uh, for the surgical robot was human loads and like any, and i think like that's like for a teleoperated system when you like say human was... loads you mean like like the patient falling over and like putting an unanticipated load onto the system or you mm -hmm. mean like resistance of soft tissue uh, to like you know a surgical tool or like what are you what are you referring to in particular? Yeah, actually all of the above, and there nice. is one more. <laughs> there is one more thing here, which is operator loads, right? So you know during setup, we would have an operator that would move and set up. You know that you know I said you know there's this remote center of motion. 
So they are, they are they are setting the robot up. And that in center of motion place. is the incision that you were referring Correct. to. Okay. Right. But in moving this, there is some person that's moving the robot on a card. Uh, you know, that's pushing the buttons and moving the actuator. So now you have to contend with what happens if a 95th percentile male is going to rest on the robot because they do. Because in the end, it's like it's a fixture, right? So you have to, you know, and there are standards for this that you can use, but. Like all of those loads exceeded what you would see. You can't just the- write in huge letters like "not an armrest" <laughs> across the whole no. robot. Uh, you can, but there is still a chance that they ignore yeah. it. Right? Like you, you, you cannot take full credit for it. No, I, I agree. Um, and you see that in like so many different situations where like just user error uh, changes the design constraints of the problem and. Yeah, it's and, interesting they refer to a ninety fifth percentile male. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think like we we uh, you know our um, our uh, clinical affairs and human factors did engineering for it, and this was a constant back and forth where we like yeah, but they should never do this, and we were like no, nope, it's not it's not a user error, it's a user error. It's like you haven't designed this right. If you cannot go to the regulator and say, oops, I did not anticipate this happening. Uh, and it was crazy. I think we had thousands of requirements because, like, because you know, the clinicians touched all different parts of the system. You know, there were so many requirements that kind of just came from from that, and like being able to handle all of the abuse load. I mean, you know, uh, unintended use cases, but it still happens. Your system needs to tolerate that. Yeah. Like, if you're in surgery and someone accidentally leans on the robot and you end up like, you know, hurting someone, like that would be really bad. So. You know, we would take that into account and then the factors of safety went up, you know, based on those loads. So it's got to be able to withstand like a fully grown man, like putting all of their weight onto it. Um, yeah. And then, yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> nominally, so, you know, like the system was designed to handle as much as you can. And then you also have to monitor those things. So if something moved when it shouldn't have moved, you know, the, the system would throw an alarm and say, hey, I, I noticed something, you know, it's like if you don't put the brakes on or if the brakes are on and you detect motion, you're like, uh, hey, you better check this because something is not right. So you had like the alarms and indicator strategy was was really involved. And again, like I was like, that was just when I was like, all right, I've done all of this design. I understand all of the sensors, all of the, you know, like all of the hardware that goes into it. But you know what really makes this a cool product is like then what is the software doing? What are the off nominal cases doing? If there is an issue, how are you notifying the user of that? Is the user going to notice it? Right. So there's like a whole standard on like what are the alarm lights and the alarm frequencies which are like which you pay attention because you know and I think if you've been in a hospital environment like it's there's crazy everywhere. It's beeping everywhere. So like how do you make sure that they're going to notice it? And then how do you do this without overwhelming them? So this is all of these really interesting systems. Oh, that's questions. interesting. That's really interesting. I mean, that that gets into like, um, I mean, human factors, really, which is like a particular offshoot of, of just, I, I don't know if it's a subset of systems engineering exactly, but like that's the interplay is it. So here's an interesting question for you, which is like, how do you think like human factors engineering and systems engineering play together? Uh, I, I mean, I see them working very closely together. It's it's like saying where do you you know where do you put your customer requirements and systems engineering you know if, I think they I think they are pretty coupled. If you make a system that doesn't play well with the human operator, um, then I, I think systems engineering has failed. Uh, organizationally, the way um, I've seen it done is be part of the team. So you know at, at Medtronic, it was just kind of we reported to the same you know uh, we reported to the same manager. It was all under systems engineering director. Uh, so, and then they, uh, we used very similar frameworks as well, right? So, you know, uh, you, you know, similar to how you do FMEAs, you would do similar analysis with use cases and like, you know, talk to work through all of your off nominals and make sure that you have that covered. Cool. And then they also fed into requirements. So they will have just human factors requirements, which would be, I think the only difference is how you verify it. I think that's what's different. You know, for systems engineering, most of your requirements are like, you can run an engineering test and you get something quantifiable, right? Like if I say, 
my accuracy is X, you can say, well, you test something, you, you get a statistical sample and you say, yeah, you know, based on my normal distribution and confidence intervals, you know, if my number is 10 and you measure uh, four and the standard deviation is one and you, you know, you can say, okay, you can gauge, you know, you have statistical needs to do that. For human factors, I think you have to do more validation, right? And I think that- that Makes sense. Uh, you're like, I, I think the acceptance criteria is different and I, I believe it's higher, right? So, uh, you know, if you have, if you're just doing a sample with 10 clinicians, and then if you have one of them that completely ignores your warning, um, <laughs> I, I think that the, the rationale might be different or like you might have to work through that differently than what you do with engineering, where it's like, you know, if, if you have your standard distribution and if you have your mean and normal, you know, mean and standard deviation within certain bounds, it's an easier justification. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, I like I like the um, you know the verifiable versus like you have to take it to validation to figure out if it worked or not like that. Yeah, that seems like a clean break to me. So, and I mean, yeah. obviously, like you know, the design process and, and you know, I think that goes pretty hand in hand with human factors work. You know, is more nuanced than that on the front end, but I think on the back end, you know, like yeah, I mean, got to validate it. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's much harder. <laughs> Like human factors testing uh, is is definitely a lot trickier because people are different, and you have to also take like what context they're operating in, right? Like you might have an alarm that someone will will pass, but then when you do the testing, you have to get a real world environment, so you you have to give them the sense of an emergency, right? So it's not uh, you know you have to recreate the environment of oh you had this failure. And then this alarm came in when you were trying to do this other thing and did you pay notice to it or not? So, so it's much harder than like, you know, like you're like measuring the accuracy, which has its own challenges, but yeah, yeah, I guess I would say harder. It's just different. I mean, it sounds pretty hard to me, like to, to try to get in somebody's head and, and replicate that exact failure condition or, you know, yeah. whatever condition I guess is, is more yeah. accurate. I mean, that's, that's incredibly difficult. <laughs> so. yeah. And you know, we, it's like, you would think looking at zipline, you don't have to do that, but like, because we, we still interface with humans, right? Like you, you know, there are operators who are, you know, responsible for making sure, you know, who are monitoring the aircraft, you know, if you will. Um, and then, you know, you also have to deal with, you know, people who load up, you know, operators who load our package or, you know, how the recipient reacts to getting a delivery, for example. So, you know, there isn't, I think there is an element of validation that's applying as well. It's just like different compared to a surgical robot, which is being touched on by the surgeon and the clinician and the patient. They work really not on for all of those. So yeah. Much more interaction. And the patient's than... not conscious. So like it's yeah. <laughs> interesting yeah. interaction modality. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's like the, the patient has passive loads, but they still have loads. Like their body interacts with a robot. Yeah. <laughs> I guess... I mean, does it count if human fa as human factors if the person's not conscious? Well, maybe. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think from, from that standpoint, we do not like take them. But you know, whether human factors comes in is if they are looking at the robot before they're getting sedated. How oh, yeah, yeah, that, I, I agree there, yeah. Uh, if it's like but yeah, you're right. Like, and, yeah. I mean, at that point, you're kind of just, you know, along for the ride. <laughs> yeah. But you know, you you I you think know, you know it 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 it, bec it became an element in the industrial design of the robot, which was interesting. Like, how does this perceive? Is this perceived as being approachable? I like that. I mean, and, and that makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, if you're looking at something that seems, you know, safe versus murderous, you know, like I mean, that's yeah, that's a huge ID uh, piece, I guess, when you're designing a piece of surgical equipment. You know, it's yeah. Like, which, you know, it's kind of interesting, right? Like industrial design wasn't really a thing in like the early 1900s. Like everything was very, very function based. I feel like it was right? the early 2000s that started getting taken really seriously as discipline. But maybe before that, it started getting practiced. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like, I think automobiles maybe like drove that, right? Like you, you start with your just like function. You're like, this is what this does. It's a box. It's a sheet metal thing. But I was like, now, nah, like. Yeah, yeah, but then you had luxury brands, right? Which you know they had to be perceived differently. It's so like a Cadillac isn't supposed to feel, you know, like a Ford or whatever. And like, 
you know, it's there's supposed to be something about it, but I don't think they called it industrial design in those days. I could be wrong, but like, I think to like engineers who came up in the '80s and '70s, like which, and I mean, we we interface with people like that, you know, at work. Like when you ask them about like people that have always been in just straight old school engineering, you ask them what they think of industrial design, and often the answer I got from one of my colleagues who kind of came up in the '80s was like, "Oh, that's like someone that sketches up." drafts you know like a draftsman I'm like no <laughs> like no, yeah not not even a little bit you know <laughs> but, yeah but yeah okay. it's like it's very much like you can you can put a skin on whereas like i think now it's like if you if you're building a product today it's like especially a consumer facing product i think like your like how it appeals to the customer might supersede if not be at the same level as like the function that this needs to do yeah, yeah, makes sense to me. And it's not just so I think another thing that people get confused about industrial design, which is which is interesting and I'm basing most of this off my I guess my interaction with industrial designers at work and, you know, like um, you know, reading like the art of innovation when I was growing up and, and stuff like that. But um it seems like it's not just making something pretty, it's also making it pleasant to interact with. Yeah. So yeah, like that's that's huge, and yeah, I don't think people really did that in until recent. I mean, they sort of did, but they sort of did. I mean, people users definitely noticed it when something was pleasant to interact with, but I don't know. I feel like that was kind of an afterthought. Like, all right, now make it nice, you know, and like yeah, you know, like the and you just like stick it on, you stick on a skin and make it look different, as opposed to like it is an integral part of the design. Yeah, exactly. Like like the the frame is shaped a certain way because of how you know the user would perceive it and, and design and engineering, like especially on the front end of, of a new product development, when you have a clean sheet of paper, like design is heavily involved or they should be at that point. So that, you know, you, you build, you know, a frame that, you know, and bones and everything like beyond the skin deeper than that, that, that fit the design requirements and, you know, yeah, like it, it it's critical. You know, I, I think about like, so because I have to, like I'm sort of comparing as we're talking about it, like how how things were done at Medtronic versus how things are done at Zipline as well. And it's interesting here because like you know, especially for the Droid, uh, it's really like the, the design almost drove the engineering, if you will. Oh, right? that's because, cool. uh, because like like you know, we, we wanted like we, we want this product to feel safe and secure and approachable and friendly. Which is why the um, fan is totally enclosed and like it's like called a droid and it kind of is cute yeah exactly <laughs> I, that's that's a huge compliment right but a lot of effort went into making sure that it's cute while still being able to you know being able to navigate through this long air column being able to you know know where it's going and being able to maneuver itself there uh it's like you know there's like a lot of elements of industrial design that went into sort of creating that cute feeling uh, and still being able to do all of the engineering function without exceeding the mass budget while also being safe. <laughs> that must have been tricky to guard that prop without like going too far over on your mass budget. Like I'm guessing that was that was pretty difficult. Um, I mean, another thing that that I mean, the droid is like, how does it steer? Like, is, is it just a like a rudder with a ducted fan is kind of what I what it looks like from like watching like the videos of it? Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I can't get into the specifics, but right, just no look at the degrees of freedom, right? You know, we, you know, it's got two, uh, you well, can, three, I guess, if you count the the thing coming from the drone. Yeah, exactly. So you know, it's uh, you know, we, we have a big fan, and then we have a, a series of small thrusters that sort of allow it the degrees of freedom. That oh, you see. okay, that makes sense. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. I'm like, you know, how how do you make sure you get? Uh, you know, it, it still has to be quiet, right? So, you know, like, you know, if, if you just have small, like, you know, you don't want it to sound like your vacuum when you turn on <laughs> You still want that. Like, that would defeat the whole purpose of it. So, a lot of engineering went, a lot, and a lot of testing, too, because. Oh, wow. Uh, and I was driven, like, yeah, it's like there was a whole aero simulation done. Like, every curve on that thing exists for a reason. And it's like it's optimized for all of these things. And That's it's still awesome. a beautiful product to look at. Well, I, I'm, I'm sure you can't answer this, but I'm even imagining like the the overhead drone plays a big role in, you know, stabilizing, you know, like where that's at, you know, the position of the of the drone of the droid, and so 
Well, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I probably can't probably can't go that deep there, but I mean, it's from a controls perspective, even it's kind of interesting. Yeah, I, I, it's 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 just such an interesting problem, um, and it's also you know it's uh, it's kind of you know it's a it's a redundant actuator, so it's not quite you know, that's kind of what I was hinting at earlier, right? Like the 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 inverse kinematics problem was so the three degrees of freedom robot. that I observed is probably an oversimplification. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, you have the you have this you have the aircraft in the air that can do pretty much anything you want, uh, and then you know you also have to deal with the dynamics of this whole thing, and you're also interacting with your environment. So, you know, you, you have to account for winds as you're descending to the air column and things like that. But, yeah, yeah uh, I'm like we have a super smart controls team, and like it's not my domain on like how they're solving it, uh, but it's it's pretty interesting to see kind of like, uh, uh, you know. Like the solutions that they're brainstorming with, and like seeing the product improve. So it's like you know that's kind of the joys of systems engineering, right? It's like you 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 get to go and ask them, and still get a reasonable answer of like, hey, how how does this thing work, and how do we make sure that um, you know? And that's like I think that's like the most fun part of my job is like being part of your job description to make sure that you talk to all of these really smart people <laughs> and like and make sure that you get all of the technical details to so still make sure that okay in the end we are going to meet our power budget and then this is the allocation we have and then you know this is the safety corridor we need to think about so like being you know you know as your podcast is like collaborate with them on like developing that solution yeah, I, I I really like the systems engineering work that I get to do um, for the same reason, right? Which is you get a bird's eye view of, of everything and you, you know, ascertain that through, like you put it, like lots of conversations with super intelligent people that are in the weeds on all different parts of the system. And then, you know, you get to kind of amalgamate all that knowledge into like a systems level overview, which is which is super cool and, and sort of, like you said, work with everybody. So. Yeah. It is. It is. Um, and I, I, I mean, I feel like your background in, you know, I mean, you've worked across the board. It sounds like electrical, mechanical software. I mean, like that's what you need to be a really, really good systems engineer. Like I, I, I don't want to, you know, talk too much smack, but I feel like I, I'm not really too sure. I understand the concept of like a systems engineering program in school, like being like an undergrad degree. And that's like, if you if you study systems engineering but you don't have like hands on engineering expertise and and practice like as an individual contributor in a bunch of different areas, I feel like you don't really have the context to put that into practice. And so like it's I don't know the best systems engineers I've met. I guess what I'm trying to say, like it, like understand you know like electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, and software engineering, and often like aerospace or controls and different engineering subdisciplines and are able to apply that. And I feel like everyone's always got like a long tail of like, like the thing that they know the most out of all of those that they bring to the table from their perspective as a systems engineer. But, you know, I don't know the, the really, really kick-ass systems engineers I've, I've had the pleasure of working with in my career have had some deeper domain expertise that then feeds into their systems engineering expertise. Sorry yeah. That was a bit it, of a it, monologue. <laughs> no, it's, uh, I think there's a place for it too, right? And I think especially at, at larger companies where, you know, you have the mentorship to, like, system engineering is a vast discipline like any other, right? So I, th there's there's definitely, you know, like individuals that I've met, I kind of work with who started at systems engineer. Then you see, you know, you, you have a lot of them in the medical device space, especially because, you know, it's such a complex realm in itself. And then, you know, within systems, you can specialize in regulatory facing, or you might specialize in human factors facing. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, you're right. Maybe that wasn't fair of me <laughs> to, to say uh, that. But, but, but I think at the same time, like, I, I relate with what you're saying. Like, it, you know, those battle scars help. It, 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 that's what really is, right? Like, it, it, I think it helps me relate better to engineers when I go talk to them. And I'll be like, especially when you're like, Hey, I understand this is how you're building a system, but the way you're building your system is going to cause us a problem in this other thing. And at least the way I look at it is, it's like, uh, you know. And again, I think you know. I, I forget it was one of your guests at at your podcast, and I think Elon said this is like, don't write dumb requirements. Oh, that would have been Vinnie Kemler, I think, that quoted that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks uh, for watching that. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> 
Yeah, I was like, there's, requ- there's, there's a person who said requirements in your podcast. I, I got to listen to that and see what, what they're talking about. But I think that's, uh, uh, you know, in, in more mature yeah, It's programs, easy to over-constrain. <laughs> yeah, but then it, there's also there's also room for that, right? Like, if you know, if you have, you know, you know, if, if you have an aircraft that's been in operation, if you want to give them, the design is a very constrained problem. Like, I don't want to tell you just like, Hey, just like replace this landing gear, but I'm not going to give you any more constraints, and I'm, you only get to change one part, right? So, <laughs> it's like in that, I want like you know, give me as many requirements as you can, so that we make sure that the part is compatible. But then, when you're building a new system, it's like you know, setting the requirements at that right level is you know, it's a little bit. It comes with experience, with a little bit of skill. And it's a little bit of iteration on like just like figuring out what is the right level. Like, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't feel comfortable with saying there are no requirements period because the, then you know you, especially when you're trying to you know have a large team make one product and not have that you know the pain of integration. But it's a little bit of a balance on how, how, you know can I set tier interfaces to give you as much freedom as you need as a subsystem. But still making sure that your stuff is going to play nice with the other team when we put it together. That's a great way to articulate it. <laughs> yeah. Because, I mean, yeah, you want to give people, especially as you put it in the early stage of product development, the autonomy to come up with, you know, creative solutions to, you know, essentially, you know, fit the purpose of what their subsystem is supposed to be doing, but without, you know, screwing over the other subsystems. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. That fits. And I, and I think that's, you know, it, it was fun with that zipline when, when, when I started on P2, we were kind of building the program up from scratch. So uh, I, I think what I really appreciated is like, you know, I got to spend a lot of time with, you know, the CTO, the, the VP of engineering, where we went through all of our high level requirements. Uh, and we were like, it's you know we are writing this high level requirements, but let's put all of the context in that so that you know when someone reads the requirement, even though they might read a value, they understand what is the rationale and what parts of it are flexible versus not. Uh, so it's like yeah, it's like it, we, we call it like zipline light systems engineering, like ha- making sure we have all of the hooks, but also all of the flexibility. So it's it's That's pretty it's, cool. been, it's been interesting to evolve that, and it's still it's it's still something in the works we'll see how that all pans out so the idea is like if an ic on on one of the engineering uh functions comes up against a requirement that they're like if that requirement didn't exist i could build something awesome for like the system as a whole yeah then they can talk to systems engineer and be like why is that requirement there and you can be like yeah i think it's this reason and they're like well you know what if we changed it to this would it still you know play nice with the rest of it and you're like yeah i think it would all right do it you know so yeah yeah that's, that's so, pretty cool yeah not being prescriptive there but also like making the card range right like there are there are certain things that are really important and if you don't have requirements period then you're like well what is what is more important how do i know what is the one thing i want to protect for yeah well i think i think maybe prescriptive is a good word too for what i was like thinking by like like over constraining you know the solution like yeah mm-hmm. so yeah, that makes sense. I, another thing I love about like systems engineering conversations, and you know, we're, we're certainly having one now, is that um, it gets very philosophical. I feel like, like even when you're like at work, you know, and and doing actual real life systems engineering, like it's just it's deeply philosophical, and you know, it's it's a lot of like getting brains on the same page, and you know, it's it's a lot of it comes down to human communication and understanding intent and defining intent. And then, you know, like delving way deeper and making it, you know, verifiable. And so like, that's, it's, it's a sweet discipline. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, definitely. I think it's, it's, it's very gratifying when it all comes together. Uh, And it's cool to have a team that sort of, you know, understands the importance as well. Like I've, I've seen, uh, thankfully, I haven't experienced that myself, but I've, I've heard stories of, you know, uh, engineers calling systems engineers as not real engineers. And it's, it, 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 thankfully, it's not happened to me at my career, but, you know. I'd, I've had it happen at certain places I've worked at where, yeah. like, the, the 
the um, label I heard was like a PowerPoint engineer. Yeah. You know, like uh, <laughs> that, that was before I really leaned hard into systems engineering in my career. Like someone, someone in an R&D organization I worked at was like, yeah, we used to call them power engineers at, you know, I'll not say the name of the company, but big defense company I used to work at, you know? <laughs> so yeah. Like, All right. That's pretty inaccurate and like, you know, overly, overly simplistic, but yeah, I mean, it, it is. Oh, sorry. After you, I, I apologize. No, no. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go to you. Nah, I was just going to say it's it's refreshing to work within an engineering organization that values systems engineering, but also just one that values like, you know, like a thorough and, and you know, complete engineering process across all the subdisciplines. So, I mean, you know, I've been asked in the past, you know, to rush um, an electrical engineering job or like to, to design a robot without really understanding the context of what it's supposed to do. Or like, you know, like, you know, just make it work for, you know, just a quick demo. You know, that's all it needs to work for. It's like, well, do you want it to fail that demo? Because if you cut too many corners, your probability of that goes way up, you know? Yeah. And so, yeah. I, um, you know, I, one of my luxuries of my current job as a contract engineering uh, company owner, I guess, is that I get to turn down jobs that seem to be setting me and my team up for failure. So it's it's a huge luxury to just be able to say no, you know. Or, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, yeah, you're right, right. I think it's like uh, you know you, you lose it in the day to day fires of deadlines. But like I feel like this is nice. Like you you take a step back and you talk about like this like over oh, the long arc. Yeah, it's like it's fortunate to have. You know, you feel grateful to have the opportunity to work at companies where it is taken seriously, where you are doing something that's you know like world altering or uh, it's a little bit of a cliche that I'm making the world a better place, but you're like, yeah, you're bringing a new technology <laughs> that I know, right? It's like, I'm just watching Silicon Valley. Yeah. Yeah. Making, yeah, the, world like, oh, making like, the world a better place. Making 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 the world a better place. <laughs> but you know, I mean like, yeah, if you're building a surgical robot or drones that deliver you know, life-saving supply to anyone on this planet. Like, it, it seems like a pretty safe thing to say with a straight face and feel really good about it and feel good about waking up and yeah. showing up every day to solve a hard problem. Well, and I, I mentioned working on surgical robots and feeling like not a douche. I mean, what I really mean is making the world a better place, but because yeah. I've watched Silicon Valley, I feel like a cliche when I say that. <laughs> I know, right? I think it's a... Yeah, so oh. I've, I've, I've since replaced that with, I have a friend who, um, his name's Dimitri uh, Krivochnitzer, and I interviewed him on the podcast. And him and his wife, Naya, uh, Anna uh, Kraft, uh, who I've also interviewed on the podcast, uh, and is also my friend, um, co own a company called Xena, and they make work boots for women. So it's like steel cap boots you'd like that are actually fashionable for the women's market. And, um, he said, you feel like not a douche working on it. <laughs> you know? And I'm like, I like that. <laughs> so, so I feel like we've gone a little bit off the rails there. Um, but, uh, you know, we're in a good place. It's been really fun talking to you. I think we're at a good natural stopping point. Is there anything you want to plug on the way out, Jermaine? Um, yeah, I just want to start by saying thank you for having me. This was great. Uh, we, 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 never, we never got to the... Uh, you know, our, our, our shared experiences at CMU, where maybe that's the conversation for later. We can do another uh, episode. I'm happy to, yeah. happy to dig in. <laughs> yeah, maybe we get into that. Uh, but yeah, I, I think uh, it's just like, I by saying, you know, we, um, you know, really excited to bring this next generation teleportation uh, technology to the market. And that's something uh, I'm really proud of what we are, you know, working at Zipline and looking forward to sharing that with the world. Um, and then we're also hiring, so that's, uh, you know, if someone's listening here and just in systems engineering, feel free to reach out to me, and what, then I can... What's the best way to get a hold of you, Jameen? Um, I, I guess LinkedIn would probably be the, the best way to reach out to me. Sweet. I'll tag you in the post. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks again, Spencer. This was great. I really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, thanks for coming on. It's been a pleasure, and uh, definitely welcome back. Uh, we, should, we should do this again. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, 
and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.